Welcome to the Elliott School Book Launch Series. My name is Diane Zhang, and I'm the Faculty Affairs Coordinator at the Elliott School. Today, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Sarah Wagner, Associate Professor of Anthropology and International Affairs, whose research focuses on military culture, post-conflict social reconstruction, and forensic science. She will be serving as our panelist and moderator today, and we will begin very soon with a conversation between Professor Wagner and Professor Grinker before moving on to a live Q&A with the audience. Um, I want to say that if you have questions for the panelists, please be sure to submit them through the Q&A box, not through the chat box. That way, Dr. Wagner can get to them. Um, Sarah, would you like to begin? Yes, thank you very much, Diane. So first of all, welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us this evening. It is my great pleasure to serve as the moderator for this event, which as Diane said, is part of the Elliott School's book launch series. So this evening, we're gonna be discussing Richard Grinker's latest book, which I have right here with me, Nobody's Normal, it's a beautiful cover. It's a masterful and moving history of the stigma of mental, mental illness. So Dr. Grinker is a professor of anthropology and international affairs here at GW. He's the author of several books, including Unstrange Minds, Remapping the World of Autism, which was published by Basic Books in 2007, and In the Arms of Africa, The Life of Colin M. Turnbull, the university, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2000. Um, he's also the editor of the journal Anthropological Quarterly, He's the director for the, of the Institute for Ethnographic Research, and he's affiliated faculty with the Autism Institute also here at GW. So Nobody's Normal has already received significant attention and praise, and I thought I'd set the stage um, by quoting briefly from a couple of the reviews it's already received. Virginia Hughes writes for the New York Times Book Review, quote, a rich history woven with insights from four generations of the Grinker family's research, Nobody's Normal, shows how a society's needs and prejudices shape how it deals with mental illness. This book sings with Grinker's empathetic and authoritative voice. Colleen Mundor for Booklist writes that the thoroughly researched narrative is so engrossing and indeed even enthralling as Brinker shares both the history of treating the mentally ill and his own personal travels around the world, witnessing social acceptance or estrangement of those afflicted by mental disorders. And then finally, Alex Spiegel, co-creator of NPR's Invisibilia, writes, quote, Nobody's normal is for everyone. Patients and their families will read the book as if it were written for them because it is so personal and so empathetic. Mental health professionals will read it as if it were written for them because it's so extensively researched and erudite. Beautifully written, a remarkable history. So congratulations on this early recognition, Richard. So to get us started this evening, I will begin with a few questions for you. And then as Diane has mentioned, we'll open it up for discussion and I'll be drawing on questions that are posted in the Q&A. So let me begin, Richard. You open your acknowledgments with a remark by your wife, Joyce. Years ago, as the two of you were driving somewhere in the Shenandoah Mountains, she said, I've been thinking, you should write a book about stigma. So apart from her prompt, I'd like to begin our conversation by asking, why did you write this book? How did this book build on your previous work? Well, Sarah, thank you um, for the generous introduction. I really appreciate it, and uh, and also thank you, Diane, for arranging this event, uh, and for uh, all the Elliott School folks uh, that are behind supporting our faculty and um, making it uh, clear to our community what type of work we're doing. Um, I also uh, want to say just how honored I am to be in an event with. Dr. Wagner, because I respect her work so much and am delighted uh, to be in the same uh, kind of event as she was in recently for her own book, uh, a Harvard University Press book called What Remains. Um, I will answer your question by, by saying that um, there are few concepts in social science that are tied to a single text as stigma. 
uh, you don't even have to look up stigma in the index of a book. You can just look up the name Goffman in an index because that's where all the material will tend to be about stigma. And when Joyce said this to me, um, it really resonated because stigma can be a kind of a, a black hole that, that sort of sucks the conversation dry where you, you say, well, why aren't people getting care? Well, it's stigma. Well, why is it that people are keeping mental illnesses so secretive? It's so it's stigma. And we condense so many of our explanations into this one single concept that it just calls out for disentanglement, that we should look at it and we should see what it means and what kind of lens it is to help us look at human suffering or the alleviation of human suffering. Um, I also wrote the book because I have seen through my daughter's life, my daughter who is autistic and 29 years old, and through the lives of my students at George Washington, the landscape, the context changed so much from a time in 1994 when Isabel was first diagnosed where nobody really understood autism very much. And if they did hear the word, they thought it was a, a horrible tragedy um, and nothing else to today when we have this big umbrella, this huge spectrum that we talk about as being autism and the openness that many of our students have. They're kind of the heroes of the book in a way. Um, the person with Tourette's syndrome who stands up at the first day of class and says to everybody, hey, everybody, I have Tourette's. I might say something offensive. I have a neurological dis disorder and I apologize. Or the student who in the first day of class says, I have ADHD or I have autism and I hope you will understand this. How do we get to this point where these people are feeling that they're comfortable um, advocating for themselves, taking ownership of these words that used to demean and shame so much. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, and yet, I will say that um, as you, you've talked about Goffman and sort of this, this point where there's this uh, almost this concentration of knowledge around in this particular notion of stigma. And yet the book, if you, you know, from beginning to end, it stretches across a lot. And this is, is, is a book with a, you know, a broad scope. Um, and yet you had to make choices about how to define that, how to, how to put some parameters around the discussion. Can you tell me a little bit about your choices in particular, you know, how you've organized it around part one, part two, and part three, and how those go together? Well, you know, I have to say, if somebody came to me and said, hey, I uh, want your advice. I'm thinking of writing a book uh, that's going to cover like three centuries, all mental illnesses, uh, the whole globe, and I'm going to weave into it my family story. I would probably say uh, goodbye. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> that's not going to be possible. Uh, it is. It was really uh, ambitious, you know, and perhaps overly ambitious. Um, but but I really do think that it coheres. Um, and I I wanted to make choices of what to include in the book based on what I thought were sort of key historical moments. Yeah. And um, certainly one of those key historical moments is the rise of capitalism and the first industrial revolution when for the first time scientists had a group of people together in asylums to look at in large numbers and to classify and typologize them, which is where we actually get the invention of the very first mental illness classifications. Not that people didn't have them before, but that there were very few uh, scientific terms for it, and people were lumped together with all kinds of others, including criminals. Um, then the other thing that I found as I was searching for key historical moments was that wars tend to be a place where there's suddenly great medical and mental health progress. Um, we tend to think sometimes about medicine or about uh, the mental health professions as changing gradually over time. But the history that I recount in Nobody's Normal is one of great bursts of new ideas in research and treatment followed then by long periods of forgetting. And it's not gradual. 
it's in burst and sometimes it's one step forward two steps back yeah. you know and and it's 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 not some kind of linear um uh, uh progression um so the first part of the book deals with capitalism and the second part of the book deals with wars and then the third part deals more with the present and the legacy of distinguishing between diseases of the body and diseases of the mind and that that legacy of so clearly demarcating the mind from the body you know starting at the beginning of the enlightenment and leading to today is one of the areas that I see that's contributed to the secrecy, shame, and stigma of mental illnesses, where diseases of the mind are somehow considered uh, wholly different from those of the body and tend to bring more shame or tend to also be construed as somehow fabricated or a sign of weakness. Sort of like when somebody goes to a doctor and says, I'm feeling tired, I've got a stomach ache, I have headaches, and the doctor suggests that there's something perhaps psychological about it, the reaction may well be, no, this is real. How are you saying that I'm, this is a, a mental thing? No, this is real. Well, the challenge in that third part of the book is to say to my audience that mental and physical health are inextricably tied together. And that legacy of that separation is something we need to address through the lens of stigma. Yeah, I, I would love to um, hone in on that just a little bit. I think there was a moment in the book in that third part that really struck a chord with me and that you were talking about. And I, in fact, I think you were pulling off of um, Arthur Kleinman and this, uh, you know, imagine the Alzheimer's patient and the caregiver, you know, in um, an appointment where they're learning about, you know, the, the brain scan, right? And that they want to be seen by the neurologist or by their primary care physician as, you know, these two human beings, right? These two um, persons, you know, who have, if, and, I, and I'll say this based on my own family, watching my stepfather and my mother um, mm -hmm. as these two people whose lives have been so interwoven together um, that, you know, the scan and seeing my mom kind of reduced to the scan um, is incredibly hard, not maybe as much for her as it is for my stepfather. And there's a moment in the book where in that third part where you're inviting to you're inviting to think about, you know, the extraordinary progress we've made in understanding, right, the brain, right? And being able to map, you know, what's happening, you know, within our our, you know, this most important organ. And yet it has the possibility of disassociating or, or pulling apart, you know, that the just the human being and that human being nested in, in a social network. That's so well said. You know, when we uh, when we think about disorder or disease, you know, we tend to think about lab tests and and scans and things like that. And the wonderful thing about the work of Arthur Kleinman is that he's drawn our attention to 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 illness as opposed to disease. You know, disease. Yeah, we 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 get that. We we know what it's like to have bacteria or virus on a slide, right? But the actual experience, the phenomenological aspect of it, right? The experience of being sick is never going to be captured under a microscope. And, and it's that experience of, of, of illness that we often see um, made invisible. Um, social scientists also use the term medicalization to refer yes. to this process. Mm -hmm. um, it's like childbirth, right? It's become something that is medical. I mean, having a child doesn't necessarily have to be construed as a wholly medical thing. Uh, the way we turn a body mass, a particular body mass index into, um, into obesity, right? So I am not saying that we shouldn't be doing all this great research. Right. It's just that when we do that research, we risk losing sight of the human experience. And that also means culture. That also means the the morality, the values that we uh, we attribute to those things. So you know, there's no brain scan that is innocent. There's no brain scan that isn't subject to the values of our society or how we define the person. And that's really what we do as anthropologists, right? We try to say, hey, let's not lose sight of the social and cultural and historical context of these things. Yeah, that's great, Richard. Um, 
I, maybe I'll, I'll take that answer and wrap it back to part two, um, where you're talking about um, war and the stigma, the history of um, mental health or mental illness. And I think there's a really interesting moment where you just described um, medical anthropologists um, you know, invite us to think not about disorder as about illness. And there's this moment, it's um, in the cluster of chapters, you're kind of working us through World War I, World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam, and um, the more contemporary uh, wars in the, in the Middle East. So at any rate, you have this moment um, with the Vietnam War where there's this advocacy on the part of some veterans to say, this is not a dis like PTSD, right? PTSD, what are we doing with the D, the disorder? So I wonder if you can start us there, but perhaps um, tell us about that, the takeaway from part two within the book, because war is, it's, it's not um, the trajectory, right? The, 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 the story of wars and what we learn and how we respond to them, at least in the context of American society, although you, you do demonstrate in other places, is not a linear one. There are sort of moments, two steps forward, and, or sorry, one step forward, two steps back, yeah, yeah. so on and so forth. Okay, so right. take it away. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the, the thing about uh, war is it's very difficult to talk about wars as productive, yeah. as generative, because we want to say that they're all terrible and they, 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 they kill and um, they maim and they seem to be aberrations from the, what we would consider to be, you know, the quote unquote normal state of affairs. Um, but the reality is that wars, because they are so cataclysmic, because they are so cruel, they facilitate and they provoke new kinds of Gener of work, new kinds of cultural products, whether it's new, new fiction or new art or new ideas. And I would say there's nobody in the world that has not benefited to some degree medically from something that came out of the military. I mean, if a person is transgender today and has gender affirming surgery, the surgery that invo is involved in that came from World War I when surgeons devised ways to reconstruct the genitalia of soldiers who had been injured in war. So, um, so I, I try to uh, balance, you know, my anti-war stance with also saying that wars also reflect our values and they do produce new ways of being. Um, the remarkable thing about the treatment and research around mental illness in wars is that it, even though it's really PTSD that sort of, and shell shock and things like that, that sort of get most of the attention, right. that was a kind of a tide that raised all boats because it, it, it allowed people to think about mental illnesses outside of the asylum. It allowed people to see that mental illnesses could be, um, something that wasn't a sign of weakness, but a sign that you were a normal person in abnormal circumstances, that there could be short-term therapy, um, that we needed to expand the vocabulary that we had to talk about different kinds of mental illnesses. And that's really a lot of what we see from in war. Now, I do appreciate what you're saying about the Vietnam War, um, and people later on saying, let's get rid of the D, we'll just call it post-traumatic stress and it won't be post-traumatic stress disorder. Right. There is value in uh, medical diagnoses and it is that diagnoses drive treatments, diagnoses yeah. drive interventions, diagnoses drive insurance coverage, right? Um, and so we have to sort of balance our kind of you know, obsession with, with coming up with new disease categories uh, with the f fact that they actually are necessary. Yeah, yeah. that reminds me of um, the almost offhand comment that uh, one of your undergraduate students had talking about the experience of, of going through an economics course that, you know, the test had left her mm -hmm. feeling a little bit fragile. And she said, you know, something along the lines like, you know, after that I have PTSD. And yeah, it, was like an e it was an econ exam. There we go, there we go. So reflect on that a little bit, both about what she was saying and, and why you would why you weave it into there. It comes up. A yeah. couple of times. 
So the reason I do I do that is, you know, as much as I'm ambivalent about mental illness um, categories, um, I am very much in favor of the change recently uh, in which uh, categorical conceptions of mental illness, you either have it or you don't have it, have uh, given way to the notion of spectrums. So yes. schizophrenia spectrum or depression spectrum, of course, the autism spectrum, um, which I take as a kind of invitation to join the human condition and not just say there are people who are sick and people who are not sick or you're you're labeled and you're always going to be labeled with this thing and you can't move you know along a spectrum of care um when a student says they have ptsd or when somebody says they're a neat neck and they have ocd obsessive a little ocd or they jerry seinfeld or daryl hannah or other celebrities say that they're on the autism spectrum there is a reaction that sometimes people have and they say, no, 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 PTSD can cause extraordinary depression and suicide. No, obsessive compulsive disorder can impair your life horribly. Uh, autism can mean that you have to live your life in an institution and you need 20 care 24 seven. But I don't think that when we use these terms colloquially, that we are denying or hiding the reality of those, the, of how serious those illnesses can be, but I think we are disarming those terms to shame. Yeah, I think that's, that that's that's what I think. When somebody says I'm a little OCD, it tells us that we, they know what OCD is. They know. I mean, it's a it's it becomes part of our everyday life, yeah. and mental illnesses are part of our everyday life. No one on this call can say that they don't know somebody with a mental illness. Yes. Yes, um, that immediately reminds me of this incredibly poignant story, again, in, in the part three of the book, where it's um, Patrick, um, this young man and his two friends, um, Julia, and I'm forgetting, is it Lily? I can't quite remember. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting yeah. now, but yeah. yes, Julia, well, Julia yeah. is one of them. Okay, so at any rate, um, uh, what, it was such a beautiful story about, um, you know, about the the relationship between um, this young man whose family really advocated to allow him to to you know to to be in school with others and and it wasn't just that he was you know drifting from one class to another he had two friends right two young women were with him every I mean it almost brings me to tears it was such a moving moment in, in the book and I wonder if you could. T tell us a little bit about that story. What well, I, well, I remember Patrick's mom said that having those two friends who were like neurotypical friends um, mm -hmm. in high school, they didn't, it didn't make Patrick normal, yeah. but it made it normal to be friends with Patrick. That's it. That's right? it. That's it. Yeah. And the remarkable thing about that story too, is that he had an uncle who had autism, right. who never left the house, never held a job, had a life of of extraordinary isolation, um, and yet had pretty much the, the same symptom profile. Mm -hmm. So you look at two historical periods: the the mid this this uncle in the mid twentieth um, century living a, a life of isolation, and Patrick. Now he does Special Olympics. He has a paying job filing at a um, congressional office. He, he he files, cleans things like that. He he. He volunteers at the library to shelve books because he's great at classification. He goes to the local swim club. He, I mean, the, his network, his interactions uh, are giving him a, a really productive and meaningful life that his uncle never had. We're in a different place now. You know, I, I know people think that anthropologists tend to mostly study in far off exotic locations, but I like the quote from Hartley's book, The Go-Between, the past is a foreign country. They do and, things differently there. So when we do history, we're also doing anthropology. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to, I want to delve in a little bit to um, your ability to weave in stories in this book. And it's not just that you clearly have had many, this is a book of, of years of research and um, talking with families and, and with mental health professionals, so on and so forth. It's also a story that's um, laced with your own family. And, um, and, and there are just beautiful passages about Isabel and about your other daughter, Olivia, 
but there's also this misanthrope that is your great grandfather. <laughs> and and yet yeah. it's really important. Maybe that's that past that one needs to study as if it's that foreign country. But um, can you tell us a little bit about these figures and why they were so critical to how this book comes together? Well, I wanted to make sure that I could highlight individuals who shaped my perceptions uh, and also changed the discipline in which they worked. Uh, my great grandfather was pretty influential, but he was a pretty, I don't know, what would we say? We don't agree with his values today. Um, I mean, he was a eugenicist. He was a, he was a sexist even by the standards of his day. And, um, uh, and he really thought that there was nothing you could do for people who were mentally ill except maybe send them to asylums. But he was a psychiatrist um, and a neurologist. And then my grandfather took a different route. Uh, much to the dismay of his father, he became interested in psychoanalysis. And the thing about that for my grandfather was he wanted to take psychiatry out of the asylum. He wanted to say, look, psychiatry ten is a, 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 a a field with a bad reputation. Few people want to go into it. We're, they, people think of us as crazy ourselves, uh, that we're just sort of managers, uh, administrators of asylums. Um, we're mostly Jewish because the, they won't let Jews into the more selective programs and they discriminate, so we have to do psychiatry. Um, or in those days, dermatology too, because dermatology was considered to be just treating syphilitic sores. And in, in Germany, it was called Judenhaut or Jews skin. They called that, that was the euphemism for germ dermatology. And my grandfather said, no, psychiatry can treat the seriously ill, but it can also treat the common illnesses. And then my grandfather went further to say, we can also treat the interaction between the body and mind. And he liked to quote Henry Maudsley, who said that the sorrow that finds uh, no vent in tears makes other organs weep because he saw in World War II that a mental illness can be represented emotionally, but it might also be represented through physical symptoms, including paralysis and mutism and diarrhea. Um, and then my father also became a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, and I married a psychiatrist. <laughs> so it's sort of like all around me. Yeah. Um, but to some extent, this book was, you know, a way for me to tell that family story um, and perhaps personally also to try and integrate myself into it because I did disappoint my family tremendously by choosing a field other than psychiatry. And, you know, maybe this is a way of kind of atoning for that, that sin against my family to say, well, I'm... I'm still doing work on mental illness, so I'm I'm, I'm still carrying on the legacy of our four generations. So it's not enough just that you married a psychiatrist, correct? Yeah, but you see, she's not a psychoanalyst, so she wasn't the right type of psychiatrist. Oh. I mean, you know how parents and families can be, right? Oh, yeah. I think you're marrying the person that they would love, but <laughs> not the right type of. All right. Listen, I have a couple more questions, sure, and then sure. I think it's time to open it up to the Q&A. And with that in mind, folks, as you're thinking about questions you'd like to ask, Richard, please feel free to start typing them in. But I, like I said, I've got a couple. Yeah. Um, so the penultimate question is a connection to GW. So um, in Chapter 14, you write about electroconvulsive therapy and the stigma that surrounds certain treatments even the stigma that arises with the very suggestion that someone's undergone a treatment. And you write this, there's this really beautiful note. You say that whispers are the sound of stigma. I wondered if you could tell us just a little bit about this GW connection that you unearthed um, as a part of your research into the field of psychiatry. Sure. Um, I, I should say that Felicitas phrase, whispers are the sounds of stigma, uh, was suggested to me by a student, Shweta Krishnan. Oh, beautiful. Uh, so, Shweta, lovely. So lovely. just thought I'd give her a shout out <laughs> uh, for, for that. I'm surprised um, there. Well, yeah. she, well, she was looking at a sentence and she said, hmm, yeah. it might be better if you said it as 
this. Lovely. And so she was she was that little book doctor there for a second. Uh, but, you know, the thing is not more than uh, 400 yards from where I am now sitting. Uh, there were thousands of people who were given lobotomies um, and um, and electroconvulsive therapy. Um, I write a lot about the two of those because they used to be kind of grouped together and um, as sort of brutal um, treatments. Uh, but I am a big proponent of ECT. Electroconvulsive therapy saves lives. Um, it has some side effects, but it is it is a lifesaver, and I have a whole chapter on electroconvulsive therapy. Um, but what is what's really interesting about lobotomy is that George Washington University was the national center for lobotomies. I mean, this was the place. This is where John F. Kennedy's sister Rosemary had a lobotomy. This is where people brought women and girls in order to enforce gender norms to say something's wrong with my daughter; she wants to go to college. Uh, Something's wrong with my daughter. She reads too much. Something's wrong with my daughter. She doesn't want to marry, whatever it might be. And uh, Professor Walter Freeman at GW was eventually, you know, he eventually lost his license and so on. But uh, uh, the Portuguese man who invented the lobotomy won the Nobel Prize for it. Um, electroconvulsive therapy, that's a different story. And, you know, one of the reasons I spend a lot of time talking about electroconvulsive therapy is because, well, not just because it saves lives, but also because we have been told for the past two decades that if we can act directly on the brain and think about mental illnesses as brain disorders, then we will eradicate the stigma of mental illness. And a mental illness it would be just like a broken brain. And just as you would not stay away from a doctor if you broke your leg, you won't stay away from a doctor if you've broken your brain. But here's ECT, this incredibly effective, life-saving treatment for treatment-resistant depression. And yet it is highly stigmatized. And people keep, even people I know who've written memoirs about their sexual lives won't say that they had ECT. I mean, it's very, very private and scary. Um, in contrast, the hero of so many medical dramas is the electric jolt to the heart that saves lives right. when right. someone's, but did you, but you put that on the brain and all of a sudden it, it has a totally different moral value to it. Yes. So yeah. That's why I, 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 I write about ECT. Uh, I would say that Walter Freeman uh, and my grandfather were also um, friends and then enemies. Um, and it was really interesting to go to the George Washington Library in the Gelman Library, where we have the Walter Freeman archives, mm -hmm. and uh, look at a speech that my grandfather gave with Walter Freeman's red pen making notes about all the criticisms of what my grandfather said. <laughs> That's incredible. Okay, I promise. Last question. Um, and this one has to do with the timeliness of the book. Um, mm -hmm. You had recently, very recently, the last couple of days, published an op-ed with CNN in which you're inviting us to think about the very mental health crisis that we are in because of the pandemic. And you and I have been working on this project um, called Rituals in the Making. That's an NSF, NSF a rapid response grant where we're studying what the pandemic has done to the way people um, seek to mourn, um, mourn death, right? When someone mm -hmm. is dying of COVID or someone who's died during this pandemic and yet the funeral has not been possible or suspended and just think about grief right and grief and loss i wonder and this is my very last question i promise um i'd simply ask you what lessons or insights does nobody's normal offer us um, to help address the myriad forms of isolation and loss that we are experiencing individually and collectively well it you will know as well as anybody how many world leaders have said that the COVID pandemic is like a war. Right, right. And the calculation of losses is, you know, to help it sink in. Is exactly, the calculation of losses. But it's also a war in the sense that no one is immune to its stresses, right? right. It's a globalizing, universalizing thing. And one thing about wars is that because everybody experience stress in war conditions 
mental illnesses were less stigmatized because of course we're going to be stressed out. Of course we're going to suffer. Some will suffer more than others, but, but there will be suffering. Now, when we look at the pandemic today, we know that um, there is a, an increase in the risk of mental illness and first time mental illness. A recent study of 69 million medical records in the United States published by The Lancet showed that 18% of people within the first three months after testing positive for COVID had a mental illness, met the criteria for a mental illness. Within three months of a COVID positive test, 5% of people had their very first mental illness. These are first onset mental illnesses, never had a psychological issue before. These are like the people in war who are normal people now in abnormal circumstances. And what's more, we know that people who actually um, have a pre-existing mental illness are more likely to contract COVID. So this is a, uh, a an issue that nobody's normal relates to because it's about the relation between body and mind. It is about the possibilities for making progress during a warlike experience. And I think that this is especially true for elderly people who are more likely to have medical conditions already and therefore be more anxious about COVID. They are more likely to be lonely um, and depressed. And there are uh, a host of other kinds of factors that can exacerbate all of our mental health needs, including what we're studying in this project, which is what happens when you experience emotions, but you can't deal with them in the way that you are used to? How is it that you deal with death when you can't mourn together in a group? When you're, how can you even experience emotion when you can't see somebody's face behind a mask? And how do you think, how do you deal with the anger and the rage of grief in a situation where you feel that something has been taken from you unnecessarily in, in a politically divisive environment. I mean, these are all really, really crucial issues for us. And I think though the pandemic is the moment where we can say that just as we understood that people in wartime could get sick from the stress, so too can they get sick now. And it's not just mental illness by itself. It's mental illness as caused by physical illness, and physical illness as exacerbated by mental illnesses. These two things are together. There is no physical health without mental health and vice versa. Excellent. So I'm looking at the chat now. Um, and first of all, my apologies, I see that I, I could have spoken up a little bit. Um, so I hope that we're now our audio is a little more balanced between Richard and me. Um, at this stage, uh, I don't see any questions yet. So uh, uh, here we go, here's some, uh, from Kristen Williams. So, um, Richard, where do you see the area of mental health in the next uh, 10 to 20 years? Coming well, up? I don't know where it will go, but I can tell you where I would like it to go. I would like it to go into a situation in which we continue to do all the incredible neuroscientific research that is going on, but don't lose sight of the person in which we see psychotropic medicines as just one kind of um, uh, tool in our toolkit and that we don't give up the effort to have social supports and talk therapy and, and all that. I mean, the fear of this sort of decade of the brain and the broken brain idea is that we'll, we'll, we'll end up just focusing on medicines and scans. But you know, the thing is, medicines could save your life, but they may not give it meaning. For that, you need social support. For that, you need talk therapy. For that, you need other human beings and not just medicine. All right, wonderful. Sarah, sorry to interrupt you, but the questions are coming from the Q&A box. I see them now. I see them now. My apologies. I think this, I'm not as used to WebEx, so I'm going to kind of work my way back and then scan through, okay? So um, this is from Marsha Waldstreicher. For those, whoops, that just moved. There we go. For those with ASD, sometimes it is, isn't an issue of getting a, getting the courage to advocate for ourselves in the face of shame and stigma. When I was younger, I had no understanding of what shame or stigma was. And once I was old enough to understand it, I didn't care. And so maybe that's more of a comment, but Richard, I wonder if you could um, 
maybe unpack that idea of one doesn't immediately know of the stigma. It might be something that gradually one becomes aware of and the imp impact of that. Mm. Well, you know, I think that one of the wonderful things about the neurodiversity movement is that it has made it possible for people not to, that's great not to care. I mean, it means you are you and that's, and that's great. Um, on the other hand, we still have to understand that when we're talking about a spectrum, there are people who are seriously ill and really need care. We never know what that point is of crossover. You know, when we talk about another spectrum, like the color spectrum, I can tell you where yellow, what's yellow and what's orange and what's red, but I probably can't tell you and we can't all agree on where yellow turns to orange and where orange turns to red. And it's the same thing with um, with with our experience, where does sadness become depression? Where does shyness become autism? And that point is is where there is enough of an impairment that you need help, where there is some kind of thing that's broken down. It could be your work life, your social life, your 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 diet, your sleep, you if you're suicidal. Um, and so we're always having to make judgment calls, both as people experiencing illnesses, but also in the mental health professions of at what point do we decide that something warrants care? So another question I have here is from Paolo Delavina, um, who asks, is the term mental illness considered harmful or belittling to the human experience? What is your take on the term neurodivergent? As, and is this something that we as a society should progress to use a lot more in the future? I'll answer the, the, last, quest, the last part of that first. Uh, it's a great question. And um, I'm a big fan of the notion of neurodivergent because what it says is that we do not uh, need to uh, define people solely in terms of medical, um, uh, medical language and in, a, and in sort of a lens of pathology. We need to see all of us all of us as having strengths and weaknesses in the book i talk about the work of a psychologist named bender who looked at iq tests of people with above average intelligence but when you break it down you see that some people even look intellectually disabled in some subsections of iq tests who have actually you know have above average intelligence so that we are all different and if one thing comes out of the neurodiversity movement it is that um, when we negatively value things like autism, completely negatively value it, we fail to see that that's where we also get human creativity and, and difference and diversity. So, you know, there's sometimes as an anthropologist, people will say, well, why didn't, you know, if autism is so bad, how come it didn't get selected out by evolution? Um, because people with autism tend to be more, they're not, they have fewer kids than people without autism. Um, and what geneticists are starting to show us is that the genes that are responsible for autism are, um, are not that far away from the genes that are responsible for great intelligence and, uh, education and skill and, and, and things of that sort. And I write about this in the book. Um, uh, I actually um, prefer the term illness uh, to disorder or disease. Uh, disease, because that's the technician's term and it leads us to think about an organ, not human experience. Disorder, because it suggests that we, or at least it evokes all of those terms that we've used to stigmatize mental illnesses like a screw loose, breaking up, cracking up, all those, those, those negative phrases. Illness leads us to look at the experience of a person the full facet of a life. When you see that person with the brain scan who has Alzheimer's, that doesn't tell you about how that family is experiencing this process. That's where I, um, I come down on, the, on these terms. And I, you know, I think though that you're right in your question that the word illness has been itself stigmatizing. I think we can change that. All you have to do is look at the National Institutes of Health Every one of the institutes is named after an illness, the National Cancer Institute, the National Institute of AIDS and Infectious Di Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Neurological Strokes, and so on. Um, but then you've got the National Institute of Mental 
health because we can't bring ourselves to say mental illness. We have to just, we have to talk about it as, as health. So that's an answer to all the parts of your question. <laughs> So um, I have a question here that um, gets at the title in some ways, Nobody's Normal. So this is from Tina Westerham. Tina Westerham, what do you make of this quote by Ruth Benedict? Normality, in short, is culturally defined. It is primarily a term for the socially elaborated segment of human behavior in any culture. An abnormality, a term for the segment that uh, uh, that that particular civil, and I'm, I'm losing the rest of it, but let's just start with what we've got there. I'm so glad you asked that question because <laughs> Ruth Benedict was a very, very early anthropologist who talked about normality and was was critical of it. And um, her, uh, I have a quote from her, which is the epigraph of the introduction, which is, I don't have the book in front of me at the moment, but that the the normal is the good, what people value as the good. And here, I'd like to give a shout out to two amazing researchers from Australia, Peter Kreil and Elizabeth Stevens, who wrote a book called, called Normality a couple of years ago, 2017. Um, and they, they trace the history of this concept and how um, normality used to be, before the mid-20th century, a statistical word. It referred to a statistical average. And we had normal schools where you taught the average values of the society. Um, but then after World War II, normality becomes something other than average. It becomes something to aspire to. It becomes the ideal. And so Ruth Benedict is totally right. Normality is uh, constituted by our ideas of what we value the most and what is the good. And uh, that is why definitions of normality are so hard to come by because you know it all depends who's asking and it all depends who you're looking at right what's normal for one group of people isn't normal for another group of people i tell the story in the book of harvard university professors who were given a ton of money by the wt grant foundation to define the normal american man so they did work on hundreds and hundreds of young men to try and categorize them physically and mentally and cognitively. And you know who their research subjects were? Entirely Harvard undergraduate men. And so the, the view of what was normal became, you know, the, the white privileged Harvard student. This was in the 40s. So speaking of students in a very different set of voices, um, I have two questions I'm going to try and bundle together for you, okay? So the first one is from Olivia, uh, Olivia Weiner. She says, speaking as a student, GW's mental health services are notoriously unhelpful and difficult to access. Do you think there's any relationship between the presence or lack thereof of mental health care options and stigma around mental health care? Oh, sorry, I just it just jumps on me. I want to come back to this. Um, so that was one question. And the other one was from Emily Bailey. Um, and I think they, we might find a correlation. In many ways, lockdowns due to COVID have forced all of us to experience isolated life um, people with disabilities often face. Do you think this could impact the way we view and understand disability? So one we have about an institutional response and the other is about sort of COVID and what this lockdown that has forced so many of us into isolation. And in that isolation, are we, um, we are looking at disability in a different light. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I always face this dilemma when I say that I think that people should, we should break down the barriers to care um, because approximately 60% of people in the United States with a mental illness don't get mental health care from a mental health professional or a counselor or a psychologist. Uh, but if you want to get care, it's not easy. It's not easy to get care. You call, you can call up phys, uh, uh, clinician after clinician after clinician, and there's a recording and it says, I'm not taking any new patients at this time. And it's hard to find somebody, even if you want care. And that's where we really have to make an effort. And I think that universities have a particular burden to do this because most mental illnesses have their onset in late adolescence. 
And this is the time when people are most at risk, when, when depression, when bipolar disorder, when schizophrenia, when all kinds of other things really develop. Increasingly, we're starting to see mental illnesses as developmental disorders because they do start early. And you can, you know, sometimes it's just 20-20 hindsight, but you can say, oh, yeah, there were the signs of this earlier, but we didn't see them. And so we have to make that available. And I can tell you from anecdotes from my students, they are very unhappy with access to mental health care. It's terrible. Um, that is a big problem. Now to uh, the question that Emily asks, uh, it's there were some uh, people joking, um, autistic uh, self advocates that were joking about um, social isolation, social distance by saying, uh, yeah, autistic people were way ahead of the curve on social distancing um, because uh, they have tended to, you know, be more socially distant because they have challenges with social communication. But one of the things that people with disabilities have been begging for for years and years and years is for employers to allow more flexibility for remote working. And they have been repeatedly told by employers, no, I'm sorry, um, you have to, you know, even though I know you have to navigate the transportation, or even though I know you, you we don't have an accessible office and you have to take this elevator or take, or we have to put this ramp in, you need to come to work. We can't be successful remotely. Well, almost overnight, COVID has changed that. And so there is this new kind of uh, sense that remote work is an affordance that helps people with disabilities, but helps everybody else. It's just unfortunate that it couldn't have happened just because people with disabilities asked for it. It had to be when the rest of us felt that we were disabled by not being at work that we had to give that disp new dispensation. But um, I think that we may never go back to the kind of in-person work requirements that we had in the past, and that that is going to help people who often struggle to be on site in a workplace that doesn't provide the appropriate accommodations for them. I have a question here for, from Katrine Schultes. She asks, can you talk about the role of religion Sorry, the, the role of religion in the development of the mind body relationship that you have alluded to through at least the first half of the 19th century, the mind was associated or even synonymous with the soul. Can you comment? Well, that's a really great question and it's a, a complicated one that uh, Professor Schultheis can probably answer much better <laughs> than I can, given her expertise. She did um, follow on. She did follow on with, um, and maybe this is something that you feel is more up your alley. But how has religion contributed to the stigma of mental illness? Okay, so I mean, it's a complicated question because uh, things change over time. But you know, in, in the Enlightenment, you know, we see this this move uh, in European philosophy to. Um, uh, to, to talk about human perfection or the capacity for perfection as a link to the capacity for reason. And that if you are without reason, you're like an animal. You're a beast. I mean, even Ophel uh, uh, Hamlet says this to Ophelia in Hamlet. He says, uh, you know, without, without reason, you're no different than a beast. Um, and so there, was a, there have been a lot of periods of time, particularly in the United States, where people were uh, put into asylums with a diagnosis of religious insanity because they believed things that didn't seem reasonable or they didn't believe they believed things that were not scientifically true and so religion uh, often can be uh, seen as a form of irrationality if you're, you know, coming at it from this increasingly secularized uh, European perspective, um, you know, having said that, um, the um, the different kinds of insanity that were defined in 19th century America uh, went beyond religious insanity uh, to include other forms of irrationality as well, like love melancholy. It was irrational to be so emotionally distraught by something called love. Uh, and certainly my great grandfather w believed that. Um, masturbation was considered irrational because 
it was a waste of uh, reproductive ability. Um, homosexuality was considered to be irrational because it wasn't procreative sex uh, and other reasons too. And so I think that religion kind of fits in to uh, debates about what we consider to be reason. And the whole history of psychiatry uh, can be sometimes uh, fruitfully looked at in terms of reason and unreason. Uh, certainly Foucault's accounts of the history of psychiatry are framed in, in you know, with that duality. I, I don't know that that's a great answer to your question, but it is an answer. Okay, so um, now I'm going to pull on, um, let's see, we have a question from a colleague, former colleague, Hugh Gusterson, and Hugh asks you, are there lessons we can learn from indigenous societies about how to interface with those with men mental illness or disability? Yeah, that is a really great question. Um, I, I, I often like to talk about the World Health Organization's multi-decade longitudinal studies of schizophrenia, because they found that the uh, prevalence of schizophrenia is pretty constant across the globe at about 1%. But when they look at the outcomes, meaning do people get jobs, do people marry, do they live independently, when they look at the severity and frequency of psychotic episodes, they find that people who live in non-industrialized communities, agrarian communities, like in rural India, like in rural Nigeria, tend to do better. They tend to marry and have jobs and have kids and have less severe and frequent psychotic episodes. And nobody knows exactly why this is the case, although the running received view is that it has to do with social supports. And so if the history of psychiatry is one that is about the um, idealization of the person who is productive can work, can be individualized, aut an autonomous person responsible for himself or herself and accountable only to himself or herself, then we need to look at places where the ideal of the person is not somebody who is going to be totally independent. When I was doing work in Namibia, I asked a man and a woman who have an autistic, pretty severely autistic son, what was going to happen, who was going to take care of their son when they died? And they were confused by my question because there was a village there. And they said, yeah, but you mean when the whole, if the whole village dies all at once? Because I don't think that's going to happen. It just didn't make sense to them. There would be somebody to take care. And one of the things that I have done as a parent of a child with autism is that I continually reinforce my social networks, knowing that someday I will be gone. And I want there to be people who care about my daughter. I want there to be people who will see that they are connected to her, whether they're relatives or they're friends. And so I learn about the importance of social supports, not from the United States, but from these other places in which I've lived. Now, I'm not saying people with mental illnesses, particularly severe ones, are treated very well everywhere in the world. I have seen people shackled and in behind bars in a house that had like a little cage set up. Um, I've seen horrible things, but then I have also seen remarkable social support and remarkable caring and nurturing. And, it, and I think we can really learn a lot there. Very good. We are getting close to, um, we're almost out of time. And so I thought I would, um, maybe a couple more questions if that. Are sure, I, I've got time. Yeah, great. Okay, so this is from um, Madeline Eichhorn. She asks, how do you think the way we interact virtually, no physical touch, not getting close to people, no travel, um, so how is that how we're interacting with others in this way during the pandemic will affect the way children perceive and develop relationships now in the future? So what is what is this you know, age of confinement and isolation um, and the lack of that tactile doing to um, children as you understand oh, it? And I don't know the answer to that <laughs> question, but it is a fantastic. It's a really great forward looking question. Um, I can tell you that children, I mean, in my own experience as a dad, children need structure and they need activity and they need to have diversions and different kinds of things. And I do 
wonder about a kid that's in front of a computer all day um, that, you know, that they are going to, um, to miss out on the sort of more multi-sensory aspects of the world. I know for people with autism, the lack of structure involved with um, the kind of lockdown that we've had to experience has been tough for some people. Um, it's been tough for my daughter. Um, and that, you know, we're, we, we have to work especially hard to try and provide that structure. Um, I wish I knew the answer to that question, but I think it's a great question because it, it's going to make me think. I mean, I'm going to leave this and and think about that question for a while. So, so thank you. So one last one, and I think it's a question um, that may take us back to the overarching theme of the book, um, the value of lives and, and how some lives are stigmatized. And um, so this is a question that asks, what is your take on the concept of laziness? Does it exist? I think it really speaks to part one of this book. So, uh, yeah. Boy, uh, yeah. really good I'm sorry, question. I picked one that was tough, yeah. Yeah. Um, laziness is a culturally defined term, right? Um, I spent two years living with the, um, the pygmy, uh, F.A. pygmy hunter-gatherer, okay? Um, and they, um, they spent a lot of time sitting around. And they don't spend that much time eking out a subsistence. They get what they need, and then they relax, smoke, drink, talk. The F.A. and Mbuti pygmies in that area spend more time, the fathers spend more time with their children than in any other society where anybody's ever done time allocation studies. So. On the one hand, if you're looking at it from the model of the economics professor who's talking about maximizing our gains, they look lazy and you could impose that judgment. On the other hand, you could say, look at these dads who are so involved with taking care of their children. Um, isn't that a wonderful thing? So laziness is like normality in the sense that it is a value that we create and that we define. And what is lazy in one uh, setting is not going to be lazy in another setting. I mean, it's a it's a it's a negative word that 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 really fits, you know, with the ideals of capitalism, right? Okay. Final question. I promise this is the very last one, and I think it's a good one to end on. This is from um, Marsha Wallstriker, and she asks: On the opposite side of the mental illness coin is recovery. Do you think it's a good term or can you think of anything better? Recovery has been a very um, important word um, because I think that it tells us that uh, even if we can accept that serious mental illnesses can't be quote unquote cured, they can be treated and you can get back to a life that may have been impaired by your mental illness. So I think recovery is very, very useful, right? Um, the notion that something can be cured is not only one that sets up false expectations, but it also suggests that the aspects of your personality and your experience that are involved in a mental illness are somehow completely encapsulated by this mental illness that will somehow be eradicated or cured. Um, and, you know, the reality is that all of us uh, suffer. Every human being suffers. We're all on some spectrum or multiple spectrums. And the spectrum is an invitation to join people in the human condition and to be dependent, to, to suffer, to need help, to need the care of others. And um, I just don't like to think in terms of cure so much as I like to think in terms of people getting better. And that's really where recovery leads us. I think that is a very um, 
empathetic strand that we see throughout the book. And I think it's a, that your reviewers have already recognized. It's a good note to end on. Um, Richard, I just wanna wish you, uh, I wanna thank you for this, after, this sure. evening. It was a wonderful conversation. And also I just, I'm excited to see um, how you know, the wider readership um, receives the book. I, I can tell that it, um, it's been recognized for its, its extraordinary value. So thank you. Like thank you for doing this. I really so appreciate much. it. And thanks to all of you for, for, for joining. Yes. I've also Thank put you. Dr. Grinker's in Sarah's last book into the chat. Oh, great. For yes. people for it is book amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful book. Well, thank you all. Um, and uh, Diane, once again, and uh, a, a wonderful series, book launch series, and especially this evening for keeping us on track and me figuring out the chat. So. And making sure that the technology worked properly. Thank you. No problem. Everyone, if you have been delighted by this event, please continue to visit our ESI book launch series page. We aim to get around one to two launches per month. So stay tuned. And everyone have a good evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.